I'd like to say a few words about the perennial problem of equivalence in relation to my book called Exploring Translation Theories. And I'm particularly interested here in some comments on that book in another book by Jenny Williams called Theories of Translation, published in 2013, where we read in Exploring Translation Theories, Pym implements this approach, that is the equivalence approach, by proposing two new terms to categorize equivalence. And then uh, we hear that there is natural equivalence and directional equivalence. Wrong. Sort of wrong. My work in that book is not to talk about equivalence, is not to propose categories of equivalence. What I was doing there was looking at the previous theories, the old theories, the 50s, 60s, 70s theories of equivalence, and trying to categorize them. And I put into one box the theories that assumed that there was a natural equivalent somewhere, and the other theories that knew that translation is a productive creation of equivalents, and that because it's an act of creation, there is no uh, guarantee of return back to anything natural. Okay, I was categorizing theories. I was not talking about two kinds of equivalents. And if you can't grasp that, then you get a lot else wrong uh, about that book. I was putting those theories into paradigms. And the definition of a paradigm is, is that there's a border between two paradigms when people in this paradigm just don't understand what the people in this other paradigm are saying. And the term equivalence is a prime example of this, that the people over here were using equivalence in one way, and the people over here were using the same word in a very different way. And, and quite obviously, I, I was talking about equivalence in that book, and uh, Jenny Williams really didn't understand what I was doing with it. She's, she's operating in a different paradigm, Unfortunately, not in my book, apparently. I don't know. We'll have to see. Let's, let's read on. But I think that's an important distinction. Here we go. Having made this quite clear distinction between natural and directional equivalence, Pym then quotes the first part of the definition of translation given by Nida and Tabor, which reads, reproducing in the receptor language the closest natural equivalent of the source language message as an example of natural equivalence. No, be very careful. As an example of the kind of thinking that can lead to natural equivalence, the kind of thinking that leads, well, led Nida to say, if you haven't got lambs in your culture and you've got seals, then use seals. That's natural equivalence as a mode of thought. Okay? Not, I'm not categorizing the equivalents, I'm categorizing the ideologies by which it was produced. Williams goes on. Given their commitment to dynamic equivalence, it's unlikely that Nida and Tabor had what Pym terms natural equivalence in mind. Hello? Why? Why would that be unlikely? Especially if we recall the second part of their definition first in terms of meaning and secondly in terms of stuff. I don't know what's going on here. Okay? Now, it's true that some 19 pages later in my book, I describe Nida and Tabor's actual application of the theory as profoundly directional because uh, they recognize two different kinds of equivalents and, and I would want them to recognize many more different kinds of equivalents. But I'm not talking about that. I mean, I'm talking about their, that ideology of natural equivalence, when in practice, in the critique that I make of those theories, I quite readily concede what is quite obvious to me and to most people, that there are no natural equivalents, except the highly artificial kinds imposed by the authorities, authorities usually of, of glossaries and official terminologies and phraseologies. Now, it, it's insulting to me, also to the theories, I think, to assume that um, I was using the term of equivalence and naming two things and that I was thereby uh, 
allied and defending that term or that mode of thought or that other mode of thought. No, my work was to categorize and try to understand prior theories of translation and to see their interrelations. Williams actually starts off her book in the preface somewhere there, let me go back to there, um, saying that uh, Fim chose the concept of equivalence as the organizing principle for his book on translation theory. This was a controversial move for, as we shall see, equivalence has become a rather unfashionable term. Good. But no. The thinking in the organization of the book was partly chronological, and equivalence was there as the foundation of a long debate. But it's certainly not central. The central problematic was the certainty assumed by equivalence and the uncertainty of the whole indeterminist paradigm. And as I've said elsewhere, the book is structured around that debate between uncertainty and the presum presumed certainty of the early linguistic approaches. That's the center. That's, that debate is the center. And to not see that, I think, is, is really uh, missing the point uh, quite radically. You also miss the point because uh, in that you grasp the specificity of translation as a communication act. Translation as a communication act is subject to extremes of uncertainty, of lack of cultural reference, and therefore uh, the more important attention giving to the various levels and regimes of, of illusory certitude. Uh, that's the sense in which equivalence becomes a, uh, an important point of departure. Uh, but to assume that I'm a theorist of equivalence, defending it against everything that came later, that came later, is is uh, really, once again, missing the point. Now, where Williams gives the game away, I mean, I couldn't. I was reading her and really not understanding what goes on until I came to this following passage. Uh, talk about you know, <laughs> getting into the paradigm. Uh, here she says. The main difficulty with the debates about equivalence outlined in this section is that they decontextualize translation. All right. While slow can be translated by ralentir in the context of road signs in France, this is not the case in Canada, as Pim's example demonstrates. And then she says, uh, other instances of slow in English, slow cooking, a slow movement in a classical symphony, a slow coach, would require quite different translations. The concept of equivalence here, where? In what you've just said, where? Who ever said that an equivalence, at least in the, in, in the regime that goes from uh, Vinay Dawale through Cadfor, that equivalence is word for word, you know, and that's it. Uh, firstly, they've never translated. And secondly, they've certainly not read any of those theories of translations. Uh, Equivalence in Vinay Dabolet is the radical transformation of idioms, uh, finding one that, that, that's located. Now, and, and, and to go earlier, you know, if you go back in the Russian tradition, you get early terms of equivalence, which were always complemented by substitution as being necessary in other cases. Nobody in that paradigm has ever said, where this is one word, then there's this other word. That's terminology. It's not translation theory, it's certainly not equivalence theory in the history of the paradigms I've been following. Now, somehow, Williams assumes that that basic, stupid notion of equivalence is what everybody's been talking about for 30 years or more. No, I think what's happened is she just hasn't read, or certainly hasn't understood, what those linguistic theories were doing in their day, and why I should be interested in going back to them now. It's because they were substantiating, through their ideologies, the illusions created by the Western translation form today. And if you don't understand that, I suggest you not write about translation theories. At least don't read my book. Talk about somebody else. While I'm on the book, later there, she goes back and she's talking about uh, engaged theories of translation and universalist ethics. And uh, I think she criticizes me for defending a regionalist ethics. 
and then says, well, I allow universalism. No, I don't allow universalist ethics into the, the realm of translation ethics. I think the translation is a specific object of knowledge. I think that there are professional ethics uh, involved in the way we deal with that object uh, of knowledge. And there are also academic ethics in the way that debates are carried out, research is done, and knowledge is created about that particular object of knowledge. We've all got our personal ethics, our personal beliefs about what's good and bad and right in the world and what has to be changed. And those things come through in what we say about translation or anything else. I'm not you know, putting on a white coat and pretending I'm not a person like any other person. But in the rules of the game, I think it's necessary to take my claim to regionalism at face value. I'm saying that in the ethics we, concerning translation about how people communicate across cultures, we have to suspend our personal universalist beliefs and engaged in a serious analytical consideration of this object of study. And I really, really wish Williams had done that in her book.